Hello, we're gonna do a quick study on the uh, on God's name, Yahweh, uh, stemming from the Book of Esther. Esther is a uh, fictional, made-up book. Esther means stara or hidden star, as in the uh, six-point, possibly the six-point hexagon. And uh, Esther is is the uh, Ishtar, Babylon's sex goddess, possibly of uh, the great whore Babylon from Revelation. Uh, Esther, the great whore Babylon, are the same. And uh, her queen it was the books about. Uh, I'm, I'm just discussing this because we're going to get to Yahweh's name, which is hidden in five hidden acrostics. God hid his name in a Kenite's words in this fiction book made, written by a hateful, vengeful Kenite. Uh, her queen saved the people and uh, made them believe in the villainous Haman. And uh, keep in mind throughout this whole study that. Uh, the, the Haman and all the good of the bad, uh, all the bad of the good and the good of bad. It's a books written by a hateful Kenite. Haman uh, wanted to kill all the Jews at the taunting of Esther's cousin Mordecai. Mordecai means little man or Maz worshiper. The book has an evil, sadistic tone of murder and revenge. God's name not mentioned once, except the five hidden acrostics. Not even prayers to God. None in the entire book. The book is a work of a Kenite with a wicked imagination. Although fiction, it reveals plans and plots of our enemy, the Kenites. And, uh, it's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is a fictionist book, fictitious book. One, there's no mention of God. Two, there's no prayers. No prayers to God. Three, uh, there's no thanks for deliverance to God. Uh, four, there's none of the characters, including Esther, mentioned in any other Bible, or any other book of the Bible, or in any historical records whatsoever. Five, there was no other early church, no other early church has ever accepted this book. And uh, six, not recognizing the Jewish encyclopedia. And seven, most uh, striking point against the uh, historical value of the book of Esther is the uh, decree permitting Jews to massacre their enemies and fellow subjects during a two-day period such an account such a biblical account should have uh, had some confirmation and, and and been found in in other records somewhere and the list goes on the hidden acrostics uh, you can read God's name is is in Esther chapter 1 verse 20 chapter 5 verse 4 chapter 5 verse 13 chapter 7 verse 7 and chapter 7 verse 5 which is written as I am. We're going to get to this right now. And uh, the book of Esther will be a whole different uh, study at a different time. So we'll get into the name uh, Yahweh, which in English means Lord. And uh, in this short book of only 167 verses, you can read this in Appendix Chapter 60 of the Companion Study Bible for yourselves. In the short book of only 167 verses of Esther, the Median king is mentioned 192 times, his kingdom is referred to 26 times, and his name, Asherish, is given 29 times. Yahweh is declared in Deuteronomy 31, 16-18, that if his people forsook him, he would, be, uh, he would hide his face from him. Here's this threatening was fulfilled. Though he was hidden from them, he was working for them. Though the book re reveals him as overruling all, his name is hidden, and it is therefore for his people to see, but not for his enemies to see or hear. Satan was at work using Haman to blot out the nation. Keep in mind, Haman's bad, and the bad is good in the book of Esther. And every time you probably hear the word Jew in Esther, it is a Kenite. So anyway, Satan was at work using Haman to blot out the nation, as once before he did use Pharaoh. As once he had used Pharaoh before, the same purpose. And uh, Yahweh's counsel must stand. His promise of Messiah, the coming seed of the woman, Genesis 3, 5, must not fail. Therefore, he must overrule all for the preservation of his people and of the land which that seed was to come into the world. His working was secret and hidden. Hence, the name of Yahweh is hidden secretly four times in this book of Esther. And the name, Iyah, which is I am. I am that I am. Iyah, Sha'iyah. Written once. The Masoretic. It's also written back and forwards, back and forwards, four times, and then back again, backwards, to let you know that something's wrong with the book. Now we'll get to this. Hold on. Stay, bear with me. 
And uh, I am that I am once was written. And that was backwards as well. The Masara, in Appendix 30, has a rubric calling attention to the form effect and at least three ancient manuscripts are known in which the acrostic letters in all five cases are written majuscula or larger than the others so that they stand out boldly and prominently showing the four consonant letters of the name Yahweh. Y-H-V-H, there's no J in the Hebrew language, Y-H-V-H, Yahweh. What people will call Jehovah is Yahovah, Yahweh, Y-E-H-O-V-A-H, Yahweh. The consonants for his name, Yahweh, I am that I am, or Lord. It's written Lord in English, you would just call it Lord. Or Yah, E-H-Y-H would be I am that I am, Yah, Yah, Now, move along, the following phenomena. The four acrostics, the following phenomena are noticed in examining the four acrostics, which are the name Yahweh. One in each case, the four words forming the acrostic are consecutive. In each case, except the first, they form a sentence complete in itself. There are no other such acrostics in the whole book except the fifth acrostic at the end, though there is one other, forming another divine title in, in Psalm 96, 11. In their construction, there are two not alike, but each one is arranged in a manner quite different from the other three. Each is uttered by a different speaker. The first by Memukin in verse one, chapter 1, verse 20. The second by Esther, chapter 5, verse 4. The third by Haman, chapter 5, 13. The fourth by the inspired writer, which is most likely Mordecai, which would be a hateful, vengeful Kenite behind the author of that character in uh, verse, chapter 7, verse 7. And now uh, the first two acrostics are a pair, having the same, having the name formed by the initial letters of the four words. The last are two pair, are uh, two are a pair, having the name formed by the final letters of the four words. And the first and third acrostics are a pair, having the name spelt backwards. The second and fourth are a pair, having the name spelt forward. Thus, they form an alteration. The first and third, which the name is formed backward, and are a pair being spoken by Gentiles, the second and fourth, in which the name is spelt forward, are a pair, being spoken by Israelites, thus they form an alteration. Memucan, Esther, Haman, and the inspired writer. And then uh, the first and second form a pair, being connected with the queens and banquets, the third and fourth are a pair, being connected with Haman. The first and fourth were a pair, being spoken by the concerning the queen Vashti and Haman, respectively. The second and third are a pair, being spoken by the queen Esther, and Haman, respectively, they thus form an interversion. Queen, Queen, Haman, Haman. It's remarkable that in two cases where the name is formed, the initial letters, the facts recorded in initial also are spoken and are spoken of in the event in which Yahweh's overruling was initiated, while in the two cases where the name is formed, the final letters, the events are final also, and lead rapidly up to the end, the end toward which Yahweh's was working. Thus, in the two cases where the name is spelt backwards, Yahweh is seen overruling the councils of Gentiles for the accomplishment of his own. And where the name is spelt forward, he is ruling directly in the interest of his own people, unknown to themselves. In the use of the terms backwards and forwards, the English reader must bear in mind that the Hebrew is read from right to, le to left, both in the spelling and wording. Now, the first acrostic, chapter 1, verse 20, in, Ham in the book of Esther, is formed by the initial letters. For the event was initial, the name is spelt backwards because Yahweh was turning back and overruling the counsels of man. The whole clause reads as follows. The words forming the acrostic being put in italic type. Uh, let's see. And when the king's decree, he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire. For it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor both to great and small. Four words we give first in the Hebrew uh, is... Let's see. It, if you were to read it in English, we do respect our ladies, shall give to their husbands both great and small. So it would be it and all the wives shall give, which would be read backwards. The first one is backwards, the hidden acrostic. And that would be the Lord. The first initials of the first letter of each word Yahweh, Y H V H. That's how you know that it's not a J, that it's God's name is Yahweh, Y H V H. It's hidden in these acrostics in the book of Esther. That first one is uh, chapter 1, verse 20. 
Now uh, let's proceed on here with the uh, second hidden acrostic in chapter 5 verse 4. It's formed as before the initial letters for Yahweh is, in, in, is initiating his action but the name is spelt forward because he is writing, ruling and causing Esther to act and take the first step which is to lead up to a so great an end. Four words. Uh, let come the king and Haman this day. Let our royal let our royal dinner this day be graced by the king and Haman. The name Yahweh is read in the invitation, containing the word be a fourth at the banquet. And that would be, let come the king and Haman this day. Yahweh. If you can hear it in Hebrew, it would be, Yabo Hamalek Vehaman Yahyo. Hayyam. Let come the king and Haman this day. That's uh, Yahweh, which means Lord. Now the third acrostic, which would be chapter 5 verse 13 is the beginning and the end for Haman has gone forth from the banquet joyful with a glad heart chapter 5 verse 9 that day yet it was to be his last hence the third acrostic is formed with the final letters for the end was approaching and the name is spelt backward for Yahweh was overruling Haman's gladness and turning back Haman's counsel four words are this availeth nothing to me English may be freely rendered as, Yet I am I, sad for no avail, is all this to me. Which is, again, Lord backwards. Sad for the, la the last letter of each word, which forms Lord backwards. So that one's backwards. We're going backwards, forwards, and then backwards, forwards, and then backwards again. Five hidden acrostics. That would be Yahweh, backwards, Lord. You can read that in ver uh, chapter 5, verse 13. Now the fourth acrostic is chapter 7, verse 7. And it is formed like the third by the final letters, for Haman's end has come. But it is spelt forward like the first, for Yahweh was ruling and bringing about the end, and he had determined Haman saw there was a cause for fear. A fourth is there, Yahweh himself. And when Esther pleads for her life, chapter 7, verse 3, the king asks, Who is he and where is he? Which brings us in Yahweh's own ineffable name. The acrostic of the five final letters spelling in Hebrew, I am. See the fifth acrostic word. Esther replies, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. The king, filled with wrath, rises and goes forth into the palace garden. Haman, filled with fear, <coughs> rises to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. That's the words, that evil was determined against him. This was the climax that end had come, hence the name is spelt by the final letters. That evil was determined against him. And that one spelt... Uh, uh, forwards the first the last letter the first letter of each word and he moved backwards so it would be uh, obviously backward English but that one would be uh, forwards and that's Yahweh that evil was determined against him or in uh, Hebrew to read it backwards would be Hara Vledye Yahlekel Yah Y H V H. First letter of the last of the first letter of the first word. That evil was determined against him. Yahweh. Now the uh, fifth acrostic. This is the one. It's translated. The cry that appears in English. For he saw that there was. Now this one is. Uh, uh, that would be Lord. Also Yahweh is Lord. So anyway, the fifth acrostic is chapter seven, verse five. This and this book does not form the same as Yahweh, but this remarkable name, E. H Y H, which means I am, yeah, yeah, I am that I am. It is noted in some manuscripts by major, majuscular letters, which have Masoretic authority. See Appendix 30. The acrostic is formed by the final letters and is the name spelt backwards. The king asks, "Who is he and where is he that dares presume in his heart to go to do so?" i.e. to sell for destruction Queen Esther and her people. In the saying, he unconsciously gives the name of him who came down to deliver his people out of the hand of Pharaoh, and had let them come down to deliver them out of the hand of Haman, the Jews' enemy, who, like Pharaoh, sought to destroy the whole nation. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. And uh, the great enemy of the Messiah, the living word, 
and uh, he was seeking to destroy all hope of his promise coming. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That'd be Satan. And make void and his children, the Kenites. And make void the word, uh, make void the repeat, repeated promise of Yahweh. Asherish only pointed to human agency, but his words point to the satanic agency which was behind it. The Kenites, the sons of Cain, is what the word Kenite means. Read them in First Chronicles chapter two, verse fifty-five. Uh, the word Kenite literally means sons of Cain. They were twins, Adam and Cain's bloodline, two separate bloodlines. Cain was of his father, the devil. John chapter 8 verse 44 and uh, that means genealogy male sperm bloodline and uh, generation you can call it which is bloodline of uh, Satan and the garden two separate bloodlines we'll find Cain and Adam's bloodline because he was not his son right. moving along uh, an acrostic and the fight and uh, Satan agency was behind it the acrostic and the final letters of his question who is he and where is he only the great I am that I am could know that and could answer that question. Esther and Mordecai knew the human instrument, but none could know who was directing him but the one who sees from the beginning, from the end, one who sees the end from the beginning. The words forming the acrostic are, who is he, this man, and where is this man? Who dares presume in his heart to do so, to, i.e. to conspire against the life of the queen and her people? And, and you can read it in English, where dwelleth the enemy that dareth presume in his heart to do this thing? Which, where, E, at the last letter, dwelleth, H, the last letter, the enemy, Y, and that dareth, H, Yah, Yah, she, Yah. Now, that's obviously going to be backwards in uh, Hebrew, because that's a, a backwards acrostic, the fifth one. And, uh, Thus was the name of the great I Am of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, presented to the eye to reveal the fact that he who said of Iyah, E-H-Y-H, Iyah, Yahashi Iyah, I am that I am. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations, verse 15, was there to remember his people. He was a generation, here was a generation in Persia who experienced the truth and the power of the name as a former generation had done in Egypt. The same I am had indeed come down to deliver them from Haman as he had from Pharaoh and from the great enmity Satan and his children the Kenites, the, the serpent, which is what the uh, serpent means. Revelation chapter 12, the serpent who is that old dragon, the devil, Satan. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, serpent means a shining one. It's Yasaf in the Greek in the Hebrew dictionary is called Yasaf which means a, shine, a shining one, a glistening, and it's from the yeah, word uh, to hiss, um, whisperings of soothsayers, and their children, the Kenites, doing his work, setting up shop, his return, coming in and claiming to be God, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, coming in and claiming to be God, and all that's above God, sitting in the temple, showing himself to his God, anyway, moving right along, um, Remember his people, of the generation, you know, then, you know, I am indeed come down to deliver, Genesis 13, from the Pharaoh and from the great enmity. I put enmity between the two bloodlines, the Kenites and the real true Israelites, the real true Jews, and the Kenites who claim to be Jews but do lie in the synagogue of Satan, the bloodline, Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 3, verse 9, you can read those. Which instigated both to accomplish the satanic design of exterminating the nation of Israel. In these five acrostics, we have something far beyond a mere coincidence. We have design. When we read the, the denunciations in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 16 through 18, and see it carried out in Persia, we learn that though God was not among his people there, he was for them. Though he was not acting as Yahweh that dwelleth between the cherubim, he was the God of heaven, ruling out and overruling all in the heaven above and on the and in the earth beneath for the fulfillment of his purpose and in the deliverance of his people hence though his name as well as his presence is hidden yet it is there in the word and so wonderfully interwoven that that no enemy will ever know how to put it out now always study to show yourselves approved rightly dividing the word of the lord the word of truth in the simplicity that christ has taught it thank you